Welcome to FaithWorks, the enlightening and empowering program that builds your faith to help you overcome every single challenge in this life. My name is Kaude Adeshoga. I'm your host. I want you to sit back, listen, and be blessed. God bless you. In Matthew 6, and I'll be reading from um, verse 19. It starts by saying, this is how you get the kingdom. This is the procedure to get in the total package. Don't store all your treasures on earth. Where moth, rust, dot corrupt, thieves break through and still even banks collapse. And if you have more than a particular amount, they say you, the insurance can only give you this amount and the rest is lost. He said, I will advise you to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So he's saying, don't just save in the bank on earth, save in heaven. Now, how am I going to save in heaven? Because I don't, know how, I don't know what currency they spend in heaven. I don't know how to go to heaven. To go, I don't know which bank is in heaven. We'll get there. Now, in verse 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. However, if your eye be evil, your whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, it's still one statement talking about the treasure that need to be saved in heaven. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. That means stop worrying about the things you need, car, houses. Don't let it consume you. Otherwise, you will not be able to put the treasure in heaven. You will put it on earth. So it's still one peace coming from verse 19. Don't be worried. Don't take a too much and put too much of your life all in trying to acquire earthly things. There's nothing wrong in owing earthly things. He said, but don't let it be your ultimate preoccupation in life. Now, he says, take no thought for your life what you will eat, what you will drink, and yet for your body, what you put on. For life is more than meat. Life is more than body. And life is more than clothing. What he's also saying, I'm just giving a hint on, I'm yet to come to the details of this teaching. But what he's saying in a nutshell here is that whatever is predominant that you need in your life to make life worthwhile, for some they need maybe some money to build a company, a house, an investment. He said, don't preoccupy your life with it. That does not mean you should put it into the cooler. He said, but don't let it be the priority. That's why in Matthew verse 33, he said, seek first. Meaning, first the kingdom, then second, that thing you want. What he's saying in a nutshell Reorganize your life to put the kingdom of God's need above your need. He didn't say you should discard your need. He didn't say you shouldn't save to buy a car. He didn't say you shouldn't save to pay your rent. He didn't say you shouldn't gather money to pay your children's school fees. He didn't say you shouldn't buy clothes. He didn't even say you shouldn't buy jewelry. What he's saying in your order of preference, what God needs should come first. Then what you need should come second. He said, if you can't do that, I guess I'm speaking 
uh, above what I'm reading. So let me slow down and read it. We're doing a teaching this morning, and I believe God is passing a message across to you to help you get this total package. Amen. Now it says, Therefore I say to you, for bodies, blood, and clothing, verse 26. Take note of the birds in the air. Can you imagine they don't even give? They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't invest. They don't have an account. They don't have a bank. They don't have a band where they gather things to keep for the rainy day. Yet God, your father, who is to take care of you, ensures that they are well fed. However, you are more important than all of them put together. I'm reading it paraphrased now. Then I'll go further. He said, don't you ever think by being agitated and being worried, you can solve one of these problems. Not, not one. Now he said, why do you worry about clothing? Have you ever taken time to look at the lilies of the field? Now, that might do quite a lot of injustice to people living in Lagos in Nigeria because I'm not sure I've really seen lilies in Lagos here. I stay in Lagos in Nigeria. I'm not sure I've seen lilies. But if you're opportune to go abroad, especially not in the main cities like London, maybe go out on the outskirts like Birmingham, you're traveling. When you go by rail, you go out of London, you're going to the Birmingham city. When you look at those landscapes, you will see lilies. My goodness, they are gorgeous. You see yellow, you see red, you see blue, you see beauty, beautiful. I don't know how I can do justice to somebody who has not seen such beautiful landscaping and such beautiful flowers. I, I don't know, but you can goggle it. You can go to Google and Google lilies and Google lilies, put lilies in Europe. And landscaping, maybe you might be able to see some of them online and have an idea of what God is saying. Because here he said, do you ever imagine how they grow to be that beautiful? Have you ever seen one lily plant leave where it is planted to go and look for sunlight, to go and look for water, to go and look for what will make it grow? He said, do you know that they don't live where they are? All they need in life comes to meet them there. What God is saying I can bring all your entire package to where you are without you going running up and down. If only you can restructure your life by ordering your priorities to be first mine and next to yours. He didn't say abandon your priorities. No, 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 no. He said mine first, yours next. Now he went further about these lilies. He said... Even King Solomon, that the glory he had, which the Queen of Sheba came to look, was not as arrayed like these flowers. That means all the money Solomon had, all the glory Solomon had, everything he did was not as beautiful as these flowers. Now he now said, do you know that these flowers can be cut down anytime and used for decorations? They can be used for baking. They can be used for anything and whoever cuts them has not committed a crime except that country says don't cut flowers but if the country allows you to cut flowers they can be hacked down anytime now imagine the investment god puts to make those flowers beautiful and anyone can hack them down anytime that looks like a wasteful investment but god is saying you are my treasure you are my investment i'm willing to make far more investment in you who will not be cut down like those flowers? Now, if I do such investment in flowers, that today they're planted, tomorrow they're cut down, how much more you? The problem we're having is the order of your priorities. Then in verse 30, it's verse 31, therefore, don't be worried, agitated, or lose sleep about the things you need to make life worth living. For this is the way the world lives. And I don't want you to live like them. I'll give you the solution. Seek first my need. 
and my what I want to accomplish. That's the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things you need, rather than running up and down to get them, I'll bring them like the lilies to your doorstep. It will be like the wise men who brought to Joseph and Mary's doorstep all the gold they would need to stay in Egypt, the frankincense, and the money. They brought it from 900 miles to the doorstep. That's not a license to be lazy. That's a that's an idiom. That's a that's not a literal statement. It's typographic. It's it's not literal. It's an idiom-like statement. Meaning, you won't need to kill yourself to make it. God will give you the enabling grace to make it. So it says, take therefore no thought for the marrow. Take no thought for tomorrow. In tomorrow are its own troubles for it to bother. Sufficient unto the day. Is the evil thereof. Now we're still talking about the total package. Now God is saying, I'll give you, you remember we said in the word, I can show you more excellent ways to achieve something. In 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about um, the gifts of the Spirit. It says that convert in 1 Corinthians 14, you can convert gifts. If you like gifts of the Spirit, you can convert them from people that you see operating them. That's why if you hang around somebody who prophesies a lot, after a while, you too, you will begin to prophesy. If you hang around somebody who operates by faith a lot, that spirit will rub on you. And after a while, you begin to operate by faith too. So the Bible says when you see a gift you need, convert it. And you can convert it through association, environment, and influence. And that was how Elisha converted and got the gifts on Elijah. He got them through association, environment, and influence. But he says, I'll show you a more excellent way. Just walk in love. And every gift you need will just show up. So the word of God has levels of glory by which you can go this way to achieve something. Or uh, it's a bit tougher but better. Another way, like I said, about confessing the sins to have your sins forgiven, or you can just walk in the light and walk in love and all your sins, whether you confess them or not, will be wiped out. And again, he's saying that about gifts of the Spirit is the same way. He's coming back to the total package. If you want a total package, a healing in your body, you can go about and be confessing by his stripes and be praying. If you want the healing of your soul, you can go about that. If you want healing of different types, you can. But he says, I give you one package. Seek first my kingdom. Then seek your need. He didn't say don't seek it. Seek first my kingdom and his righteousness. Then everything that you think you need or you don't need will be added. Do you know when the Lord appeared to Solomon, he said to Solomon, now this again, treasures in heaven. Solomon had offered to the Lord a thousand bulls. And a thousand bulls did sacrifice to the Lord. What such aroma going to heaven. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Solomon, that's how it starts. It starts with giving. What do you want? And Solomon said, obviously, Solomon wanted long life. Obviously, he wanted riches. There's no one that doesn't want riches. Obviously, Solomon wanted the lives of his enemies. He wanted to subdue all of the kingdoms and be the one, one and the main and the, you know, the overall. He wanted all those things. But he thought of God's need first. And he said, God, your people are great. And they need direction and they need wisdom to guide them in what you want them to achieve. Can you please give me wisdom and an understanding heart so that I can lead them aright and help them to fulfill the purpose and the destiny for which you have raised them? God said, wow, that's just what I want. Now, because you did not ask for what you wanted, but you sought my kingdom first, I guess I need to find that scripture. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 3, the Bible says that um, King Solomon in verse 4, the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was a great high place, a thousand burnt offerings. 
Solomon did offer upon the altar to God. So in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give to you. Obviously, God was pleased with the offering. And Solomon said, you have showed unto my father David great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth, in righteousness, in uprightness of heart. With thee, you have kept for him this great kindness. You have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made my servant king me instead of my father David, and I am but a little child. I don't even know how to go out and come in among these your great people. Lord, your servant is the midst of your people which you have chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore your servant an understanding how to judge your people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge these thy so great a people. And the speech pleased the Lord. Why did it please the Lord? Because he asked for God, not for himself. Now, don't tell me Solomon didn't want long life. He wanted all those, but he prioritized his need for God first. Then God took care of his own. And then in verse 11, God said to him, because you have asked this thing, and you have not asked for thyself long life, which is obvious he needed. Neither have you asked riches, which of course he needed. You have not asked of your enemies, which also he needed. But you have asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, which won't really fetch him much money. Behold, I have done according to your words. I have given thee a wise and understanding heart. So that there is none like thee. Now God is now adding. So there is now. Solomon did say there should be none like me. He just said the wise and understand. Now he has started adding. This is the Ephesians 3.20 prayer. Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what you can ask or think. This is how it comes. He says for God who has prepared unto us. You know I keep telling people. You don't need faith. The children of Israel did not need faith. To walk from um, where they were in the Ramses to the edge of the Red Sea. Any normal human being can do that. Inherent in every human being is a natural ability for them to walk away from Egypt. But at the edge of the Red Sea, they either needed a ship or life raft or life jackets. With none of those present, now they needed faith to walk on dry land. Which the natural ability God has given to you, you can never attain. Meaning, whatever you achieve in life in your natural ability is not what God has prepared for you. Because he has given you faith to be able to attain to what he has prepared. Which he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2. That eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men what God has prepared for them. Now there are... There are a few rich people in our nation, Nigeria, wonderful people, building factories for people to work, creating employment. And people say, does that one need to give to God? I can tell you, they've not reached half of their potential in life. Why do I say that? Because what God has for every man, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of that man, the things God has prepared for him. Now, Solomon did not know that God had prepared certain things for him. In his natural ability, he will fight wars, conquer some nations, steal this one, that one. But he may never have been as great that there will be none before him and none like unto him. He himself was not even thinking that way. He wasn't. But you need faith. And that's those who criticize the giving they criticize it, believing that there's somebody who does not give, who has attained in life. He has not attained. He has just started. Because now there is no man in life who can cross a barrier without spiritual aid. That barrier may be okay for many people until they have an insight to see what God has prepared for them that is far beyond that barrier. And to get there, they needed to cross that Red Sea on land. 
Otherwise, you would have said, but the children of Israel, were they not eating cucumbers? Were they not eating chicken? So why did they need faith again? They needed faith to enter into the land flowing with milk and honey, where they would live in houses. In Egypt, they lived in houses they built, where they would live in houses they did not build. In Egypt, they drank from, drank from wells they dug, where they would drink from wells they did not dig. In Egypt, they drank from vine yards they planted, where they would drink from vine yards they did not plant. That also is before everyone. So those who run people down, did so so and so give, how did they attend to this? Have you seen what God has prepared before him? Can you authoritatively say he has made it in life? Have you seen if Solomon didn't ask for this and he just ruled like Jeroboam, he ruled like King Saul, he ruled like all the kings, it would have looked like he made it. And that's what people would have said. Oh, was Solomon not great? He ruled over Israel, he ruled over Judah, he built this, he built that, it was fantastic. But what God had for him was far more than that. And this is how he got it. When he gave to God first and sought God's kingdom. And here God says, and because you have not asked for thyself long life, neither have you asked for riches for thyself, nor asked for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to your words, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there is none like thee before thee, neither shall there be any like unto thee arise again. Now God has added that now, which was not in his own plan. Which if he didn't get, some people say, what did Solomon need to give to get to what he was? At least he was great. But his greatness, there should have been none rival in it except Jesus. Let's go further. Verse 13. I have also given thee, which you did not ask, riches, honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all that day. So if he had been rich, who say, but he was rich? Who did he give? He was rich. Now, those who just see that way will not know that there is a giving you can give that you can be rich, that there will be none like unto you again in this life. I don't really want to talk about giving, but let me mention this. In Genesis 14, Abraham gave to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And the Bible says, Levi, his fourth generation, gave also. So when they say somebody gave, did so and so give to me, have they secured their lineage? We have seen a man who celebrated first billion in this country, who died wretched. Now, Levi was secured to fourth generation. David gave, his lineage was secured till today. So it's not just only to say, oh, you don't need, there's a natural ability. Oh, the natural ability will pick you to a point. But then you need the divine, either from Satan or from God to cross that peak, which is a horn. If you go to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 1, I think verse 18. He said, Behold, I saw four horns, and so that Judah will not raise his head. There are horns, there are authorities, satanic entities, to make sure that no man lifts his head beyond a point in this life. And if you're going to cross that point, you will either need Satan or you need God. Praise the Lord. Now back to what we're saying. And that was how Solomon, God all the things he needed, both the ones he thought and the ones he did not think. Now, he fulfilled Matthew 6, 33. He sought God's rule first. God's need first. He didn't abandon his need. No, God first, then brought his own to number two. And now God taking that, now, God now added, he now thought maybe two, three, four. God now added five, six to 200, which he never would have thought, and gave it to him. So back to what we're saying, the total package says you must seek God first. Now, God sees your soul. He knows where the hurt is, and he knows what to do to heal it. You don't know. You are, for somebody, I've seen somebody who was abused as a young man, by a, uh, um, a, a clergy, I don't want to say the denomination, and the case went to court, it was awarded $300,000 as compensation. And I watched this program, I can't remember whether it was Al Jazeera or so, it was a documentary, and I watched him and he said, I've collected the money, but I'm still not okay. The hurt is still there, 
I don't have a, not me, he said, I don't have a normal life. I don't have, a, I can't relate properly with the opposite sex. So he's still dysfunctional and he's still damaged. That money did not solve his problem. Only God can solve that problem. That is why he said the sanctification of the soul. So we said his total package, it will heal the spirit, it will heal the entire soul, and it will sanctify and heal the entire body. Do you know there are people who are, at the time they have cardiac arrest, they didn't even know they were sick. People have slept, they didn't wake up, and when they did the post-mortem um, uh, diagnostic, they found out that they had a, uh, 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 maybe an enlarged heart or something they didn't know. So when God is dealing with the total package, even the issues in your body that you are not aware of, he will deal with every single thing. The ones you think you know are the ones you have dealt with. Maybe because you have headache and they say you have this one. The one that is building up in the kidneys, building up in the liver, building up in the lungs and the heart that you don't know, he will deal with every single thing. It's a total package. Amen. Now back to what we're saying. He says, start by laying up treasures for yourself in heaven and then you will have what we call a heavenly account. And I asked myself, is there a bank in heaven? The answer is yes. The book of Philippians is in the New Testament. Now in chapter 4, I'll read from verse 15 to 20. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 to 20. And I read, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent ones and again to my necessity. They sent gifts. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Which account? Obviously, it's not an earthly account because Paul is not authorized by the state to bank people's money. He's not a bank. So Paul doesn't have a license. He's not a banker. He doesn't store money for people and then they come and collect back. So which account is he talking about? Obviously, it's a heavenly account. For verse 18, for I have all and abound and full, having received from a Titus, the things which were sent from you an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. For my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, Paul was saying, you need to give not because I have a need, so that you can have fruits accruing into your account. That account is heavenly like in Matthew 6. I believe you have been blessed by that message. And I know your faith has been built up. And I know all those challenges in life are all going to fall before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know Hebrews 12 says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. You need him in this walk. And so if you're out there and you don't have Jesus in your life, I want you to say after me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the only begotten Son of God. Come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. It's as simple as that. Displayed on the screen is diverse information on how you can interact and reach out to us. Take advantage of it and I'll be expecting to hear from you. Till I come your way again same time next week, I want to tell you don't give up. Faith works. It's working and it will work in your life. God bless you.